Good morning uh, and welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace. I am Chantal Leung-Arthat. I am the uh, Associate Vice President here at USIP in charge of the Jennings Randall Fellowship Programs. Uh, this morning event is part of a three-day program, a three-day conference organized with the generous support of the Dutch Embassy, uh, USAID, and Creative Associates International, and with the creative juices of 10 other international, 10 other civil society, uh, governmental, and academic institutions, including Women in International Security, the International Civil Society Network, the Institute for Inclusive Security, Women for Women International, Peace by Peace, the UN Association of the National Capital Area, the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University, the World Bank, and the Office of Global Women's Issues at the U.S. State Department. The two days thus far have been terrific and really extremely inspiring. Now, yesterday and the day before, we talked a lot about UN Security Council Resolution 1325, the UN resolution that is all about power and protection, power in the sense of giving voice to women and recognizing that they have to be part of the polity, that they have to be part of the negotiating tables, and protection in the sense that we can no longer tolerate the atrocious crimes that are being committed under the disguise of war. Or, as it was said by Margot Wallström, the UN Special Representative uh, on sexual or against sexual violence in conflict, uh, we cannot really wait for peace to give peace to women. Of course, in this context, we talked a lot about the DRC. Uh, in a way, the DRC has become sort of symptomatic of the changing nature of war and of some of the most horrendous behaviors of mankind. But as we think about these issues, I think it is good to remember two points that were made by uh, Margot Walls from yesterday. Namely, one is that sexual violence is not something that happens only in Africa. Europe, Asia have seen and are seeing similar abhorrent behavior. And second, that sexual violence is neither cultural nor sexual. It's just plain criminal. Now, in the two panel discussions this morning, we thought it would be good to drill down a little deeper and look more specifically at what is happening in the Congo. To take a more general view of what is happening, and then in the second panel, to examine how UN Security Council resolutions like 1325, how international diplomacy may affect and guide the action of international actors. Uh, I think we have a terrific lineup for you in these two panels. This first panel is the more general panel, uh, and I'm very proud to introduce Séverine Otesser. Séverine is a former USIP Peace Scholar that is a recipient of a very competitive Jennings Randolph pre-doctoral competition. She is now an assistant professor of political science at Barnard College at Columbia University and has just turned her doctoral dissertation into a book entitled The Trouble with the Congo, a book that was published by Cambridge University Press and there are flowers, flyers outside uh, for the book with a 20% discount if you want to buy the book. Uh, I think Séverine has developed a powerful new and very provocative argument about what I would call um, a powerful argument that emphasizes what I would call the context blind culture of international peace builders. Uh, and I will leave it up to her to develop her argument in, in a few minutes. After Severine, I will give the floor to two expert commentators. First, we will hear from Christine Karumba. Christine is the DRC Country Director of Women for Women International. And I'm not going to read her bio, you have it all in your package, but Tammy Duckworth, the Assistant Secretary 
of the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs yesterday said, women are strong because of the steel of their determination. And in that sense, Christine is a real iron lady. She has an, has an unhealthy amount of courage and determination, a wealth of experience, and has touched and changed the lives of thousands of women in the DRC. She's also the author of a new report published by Women for Women International on the DRC called Stronger Women, Stronger Nations. And the report is outside as well for you uh, to take a copy from. I will then turn to Raymond Gilpin, my friend and colleague here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Raymond is Associate Vice President at USIP and directs the Center of Innovation on Sustainable Economies. Uh, Raymond is also our in-house expert on the DRC. So with that, uh, and without further ado, let me turn it over to Sivrin. Thank you so much, Chantal, and thank you to all of you for coming. In the 15, 20 minutes that I have today, I want to tell you a little bit about the argument of my book, The Travel with the Congo. The book started from the observation that in the Democratic Republic of Congo, from 2002 to 2006, a peace settlement was reached at the national and regional level. So when I say regional, I mean at the level of the Great Lakes region, Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, Congo. But there was no peace settlement at the sub-national level. What I mean is that since 2003, we have seen the, the official reunification of the country, the reestablishment of diplomatic ties between former enemies. We have seen um, the establishment of a transitional government. We have seen the holding of national elections in the Congo. And yet, during all those years and up to now, the eastern provinces have faced massive population displacement and horrific human rights violations on a daily basis. Countless women have been subjected to horrific human rights violence um, and horrific sexual violence, often multiple times. And persistent fighting has regularly brought the Congo back to the brink of civil and international war. So the main question orienting my research was to understand why have the international actors succeeding, succeeded in helping the Congo build peace at the national and regional level, but not at the subnational level. And closer to the theme of the conference, I was trying to understand why have women remained at risk in the Congo. The existing policy and scholarly answers to this question are of two kinds. The first one is that peace builders may do their best to establish peace, but economic, political, security, or contextual constraints may impair an adequate treatment of the problems at the root of the violence. Second, vested political, security, economic, or institutional interests may lead some peace builders to consciously ignore violations of the peace agreement. My book develops a different answer that revolves around two central findings. First, violence has continued in the Congo since the war officially ended, in a large part because of the persistence of local conflict. And when I say local, I really mean at the level of the individual, the family, the clan, the community, the district, sometimes the ethnic group. Second, when we try to understand why there has been so little work on grassroots conflict resolution by international actors, we see that, of course, constraints and interests matter, and of course they did influence the intervention strategy. But even more importantly, what I call the dominant international peace-building culture shaped intervention in a way that precluded action on local violence 
and that ultimately doomed the international efforts. My research shows that Western and African diplomats, United Nations peacekeepers, and the staff of most non-governmental organizations involved in conflict resolution share a set of ideologies, rules, rituals, assumptions, definitions, standard operating procedures. This common culture influences the peace builders' understanding of the causes of violence, the path toward peace, and the roles of foreign actors. In the Congo, the presence of this peace building culture explains why massive international peace building efforts have only very rarely targeted local conflicts, and therefore why the international intervention has failed to help the Congo build a sustainable peace. So in this presentation, I will very briefly develop these two main ideas. I'll be really extremely brief because I'm basically summarizing 350 pages in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but I'd be, of course, very happy to give you more detail on any point of the argument during the discussion. Also, please keep in mind that the book focuses on the period of the transition, so from 2003 to 2006. And uh, things have evolved a little bit since then, since then, and I'd be very happy to talk more uh, during the discussion about the few recent changes. But overall, you will see that local conflicts and the peace building culture remain just as influential now as they were during the transition. The argument that I develop in the book builds on all the data that I collected for the project. So just very briefly, uh, I spent a, a year and a half just doing field observations in the most violent provinces of the Congo. I also conducted over 330 interviews uh, with um, Congolese political, uh, civil society, um, and um, military and diplomatic actors, uh, with victims of violence, with perpetrators of violence, uh, with foreign diplomats, staff of international and non-governmental organizations. And I did all that in the Congo mostly, but also in France, Belgium, uh, the United States, and South Africa. And of course, I draw on document analysis. So the book first shows how in the Congo, the dominant peace building culture shapes the international understanding of violence. Basically, most international actors understand the continuing violence in the Congo as a top-down problem. So as you all know, UN, UN officials and diplomats and the staff of most non-governmental organizations interpret continued fighting and massacres in the Congo as the consequence of national and regional tensions. So for example, they focus on tensions between President Kabila and the various leaders of the different rebel armed groups. All they focus on the tensions between the Congo, Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi. And I show in the book that this kind of top-down understanding is mainly the result of socialization and training processes. <coughs> and in addition, these international peace builders usually view local conflicts as the result of either insufficient state authority or of the Congolese people's so-called inherent propensity to violence. And I want to highlight two shared understanding that are particularly influential and detrimental and that still persist today. The first is that since two, June 2003, international actors have labeled the Congo as a so-called post-conflict situation. And this label determined a change of strategy for most peace builder. For example, since the Congo was not at war anymore, subnational actors could not be conceptualized as rebels or warring parties anymore. The Congolese actors participating in the transition became, and in the post-transition process, they became the only legitimate partners for diplomats and UN staff. 
the actors who refuse to participate in the transition and post-transition process and who continued to wage violence were labeled illegal and therefore diplomats and UN staff were not supposed to meet with them. So mediation between different combatants was not an option anymore because at least one of the parties was considered illegitimate. And we could see how detrimental this construction was in 2006-2007 when it prevented mediation between President Kabila and rebel leader Laurent Kunda, um, who was considered an illegitimate actor at that time. And mediation was prevented until it was too late. And Kunda has attacked Goma. Everything was under siege. And large-scale large violence had resumed. And at that point, diplomats and UN staff were forced to mediate and to meet with Kunda. The second shared understanding that I want to highlight today is that international actors believe that violence is pervasive in the Congo. Many international actors I met still picture the Congo as an inherently turbulent country where violence is normal and to be expected. I even heard many international peace builders explain me that rape itself and a high level of rape is normal for the Congo. And this presentation of violence as normal for the Congo strengthens the lack of international interest for ongoing local conflict. And it turns the lack of interest for local conflict means a lack of resources to address grassroots conflicts. The dominant peace building culture also shapes the international actors' understanding of their role. It constructs intervention at the national and regional level as the only natural and legitimate task for UN staff and diplomats. It elevates the organization of elections as a favorite state reconstruction mechanism over more effective approaches. Um, for example, it puts election organization over reconstruction of the bureaucracy, the justice system, and effective and disciplined coercion forces. So in brief, this peace building culture has enabled foreign actors to pursue a top-down intervention strategy that permitted and even at time exacerbated fighting, massacres, rapes, massive human rights violations during, after the transition, and even now. And this culture has enabled international actors to view their intervention as a success, at least for a time in 2006, 2007. I then suggest an alternate analysis of violence, which in part explains why the international efforts have failed to build a sustainable peace. In the Congo, now, just as during the war and the transition, continuing violence is motivated not only by the regional and national causes emphasized by most policy and academic analysis, but also by longstanding bottom-up agendas whose main instigators are villagers, traditional chiefs, community chiefs, or ethnic leaders. Many conflicts revolve around political, social, and economic stakes that are distinctively local. For example, there is a lot of competition at the village or district level over who can be chief of village or chief of territory according to traditional law. Who can control the distribution of land and the exploitation of local mining sites? And who can be appointed to local administrative positions? This competition often results in localized fighting, and quite frequently it escalates into generalized fighting. So mass violence in the Congo is not coordinated on a large scale, 
but it is rather the product of a fragmented micro-level militias which each try to advance their own agendas at the village or district level. And there is an interaction between the local and the national and regional levels, um, namely alliances between local actors and national and regional actors. But since 2003, local actors and local agendas have become increasingly autonomous and self-sustaining and uh, autonomous from the national and regional tracks, most notably in the Kivus, North Katanga, and Ituri. And there, in these three areas, local disputes have led to clashes that no national or regional actors could stop and that eventually jeopardized the national and regional settlements. So my book progresses to an analysis of the reasons why, in these circumstances, foreign actors neglected to implement <coughs> local peace-building programs. And I found that diplomats and UN staff members considered local conflict resolution as an, an important, unfamiliar, and illegitimate task, and unmanageable. The very idea of becoming involved at the local level clashed so fundamentally with existing cultural norms. And it so threatened key organizational interests that neither resistance nor external shocks could convince international actors to revise their strategies in a way that took into account the critical role of local conflicts. So in sum, my main argument is that the dominant peace-building culture shapes the intervener's understanding of peace, violence, and intervention in a way that precludes action at the local level. The resulting inattention to local conflicts leads to unsustainable peace-building in the short term, constant violence on the population, and potential war resumption in the long term. And I would be very happy to show during the discussion how this analysis can help us better understand many cases of international intervention failures, not only in Africa, but also in the rest of the world. Local conflicts are usually critically important in sustaining violence in most war and post-war environments. And the international peace-building culture almost always precludes international action at the local level. And of course, I have developed really detailed and extensive policy recommendations uh, based on these research findings. And I will just take one minute uh, to mention the main ideas. And of course, I'm, I'm really happy to talk more about that during the discussion. The main point is that in addition to any top-down intervention, conflict must be resolved from the bottom up. Again, my main argument is not that national and regional tensions don't matter and that national and regional peace building is unnecessary. My argument is that both macro level and micro level peace building is are needed to make peace sustainable. And of course, Local NGOs, local authorities, and civil society representatives should be the main actors in this bottom-up process. But there are obstacles. Um, local actors often lack the funding, um, the logistical means, and sometimes the technical capacity to implement effective peace-building program, effective grassroots peace-building program. So international donors should expand the funding available for local conflict resolution. And they should do so either by shifting their priorities <coughs> away from immediate elections in post-war uh, post area or by increasing their aid budget. And in the Congo, donors 
the UN, international and non-governmental organizations, and Congolese state authorities at all levels should focus on two high priority areas, land reform and inter-community reconciliation. So again, it's a very brief summary of my research findings and I'd be delighted to talk more about all of this during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, While she was talking, I remember when I grew up and we used to go to the villages every holidays. And while going to the village, it was the time for us to reconnect with our own identity the way our mothers and grandmothers flush water, they farm, we go to farm. It was a a moment for us to receive stories from the grandmothers about their courage, about how they they are making life to be more and more enjoyable. That was the memories which came to me when she was talking. And now in the DRC, is in the eastern part of Congo that is no longer uh, possible because of the atrocities and violences which started since 1994 uh, uh, when the refugee Rwandese came to the DRC. And I feel like I'm dying when I do understand that People can think that it's in our culture or to killing one another, to raping one another, to destroying, come again, to destroying our communities. It's not in our culture. We have been living in a beautiful context. And the beauty of that context has made us to strength because we still link to that as part of ourselves, as part of our DNA. We still have those memories as strong as we live, even despite the atrocities we are seeing. Back to the work we do as Women for Women International, we help the women to be able to move from a victim <laughs> state to become an active citizen. and. What we developed is a market-based uh, skill trainings and right education because most of the women we do work with are mm-hmm. social excluded women. They are women on the grassroots who does not, they, they never had a chance to education. And there are those women who have been in a situation or denied, not having access to education. So. What is the entire life is her family, her children, and her husband. And we have seen through the process that now those women have been refused to be wives, mothers, because of being raped. Can you imagine in your family you are cooking a meal and your child refused to eat that meal just because you you were raped? You are cast. That's the way the women are living in the DRC, eastern part of the DRC. We developed a men's leadership program because we we saw that men, sometimes we know that they are perpetrators, but also they are ignorant. Ignorance leads them to act or to run from their responsibilities. So our main purpose with the men's leadership was to let them understand the human, the women's rights and how they can protect the women, which role they have to play in the process. And we also developed a commercial integrated farming initiative where we help the women to use the uh, farming practices to grow crops and to sell and to feed their families. The program in the DRC started in 2005, 
And as a Women for Women organization, we have so far served around 271,000 women, and we have distributed as direct aid around 89 million. But in the DRC specifically, we have served around uh, uh, 37,000 women, and we have distributed around mm -hmm. 4 million in direct aid. The men's leadership is a piece of women for women uh, activity which really enable the leaders to be advocate for women's rights. Put them in a position. I remember when I participated in Walongu on one of the men's leadership training, one leader stood and said, women for women, some, sometimes you don't understand where we are. These women, they were raped before us or we are there to protect them. We couldn't protect them. We are feeling ashamed to not be able to protect those women. It's like we have been disarmed from our authority as leaders. So for us to be able to know how again to reconcile with the women, the, with the community, and to play our role is somehow our priority. It was the way of saying, let you engage us. Let us men understand what, how we can contribute. And that's where I feel like we miss our, our approach programs are missing that substance in our, our prioritization, in our program implementation for building pieces in the DRC. In the survey we conducted, um, we have seen that six, uh, around um, 93 men leaders, after they have graduated, they have expressed uh, their commitment to work to prevent uh, the, the uh, sexual gender-based violence. Committed. So they are willing to stand and to defend the women. They are willing to stand uh, as, uh, in the side of that women to, to say that has happened to you but has happened to uh, the entire community. They have targeted you but they were targeting mm -hmm. an entire community to paralyze the community. I am not the first person who said that the rape was used as a weapon of war. It really was used and still used as a weapon of war. And you know, when women are down, they are sick, they are traumatized, they, I do know that health and wealth goes together. So when they are as, at that level, the poverty will continue and the circle of Violence will continue. When we are the, somebody who is around a gun group who, which pays, they will be motivated to go to that gun group. I'm not defending that. It's, they should go to gun group because there are some values they should protect, but that's the fact. That's what is happening. And again, before uh, the main leaders uh, uh, attended the program, uh, 51 of them, they were saying that uh, actually, women, they, they don't have nothing to receive from their husband and community for their reintegration. The rape victim, they don't have nothing. Men doesn't have no, no role to play on that. But that has increased after the, the, the training session to 96%. And for us to see that the men can understand we have a role to play to appease the suffering of the rape victim, who are the, our mothers, our wives, and the citizen of the, the, the community. And I remember one man in a, is a military, 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 military officer in uh, Uvira who attended the men's leadership training. And for him, he was saying that for sometimes we neglect to to. To, or we don't pay attention to what is happening to women. And even when they come to, uh, to us to report the case, we just, we don't care. It's like, what does that, it doesn't have any concern to us. And why should we punish the perpetrators? Why? So he was saying like that, but be, when he received understanding on the consequences on the larger scale, on the community, then he start changing his perspective, pers 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 perceptions. 
And that's why me, I strongly believe that, as he said himself, that we have to train military and soldiers. They have to be disciplined. They have to know their roles. They have to work on economical development. Farmers, uh, they have to be mechanics, uh, all the job they should do so that at least they don't destroy the population they are protecting. In the uh, survey we did, um, we discovered that what the women are just saying, they still trust that peace is achievable. And that has really shaked my head and my understanding. When in the chaos where we see that in the leadership, in the security, in the, the institution is like chaotic, but the women still believe that peace is achievable. Who are we not to believe and build on that momentum? If the women on the grassroots still believe, despite the failure of the international community to uh, accomplish its promises, you can see the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. The failure is so obvious. The Millennium Development Goal, where are we in the DRC context? It's a failure, and we have to acknowledge it. When we acknowledge it, we can develop strategies at least to appease the life of Congolese. Imagine five million people <coughs> died in the DRC. I, my sister from Bosnia told me that there are 4.5 million population in Bosnia. Imagine the entire Bosnia vanished. That's what is happening. We are citizens of the earth. And sometimes those figures does not matter sometimes because it's a, it's a faraway story. But me, I live, I feel, I feel the fear of of uh, being in that context and what the women was expressing to us for, uh, for them 41% of the women they fear to go out of to go to work out of their home work home home so for them to go to farm to go to flash water in uh, that context of conflict it is like dying but what should they do they have to farm they have to survive. They have to flush water to survive. And the fear for us of uh, seeing that 87 of the men, uh, women participants, they have experienced people who have been, who have, they have lost their siblings. And what that mean fear to them? What that mean peace to them? We have to look on the eyes of the women. For them, peace is to to be able to go out and to farm. Peace for them is to have market for their produce. That means peace to them. And let us engage the grassroots as peace builders so that we can reverse the, what is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this uh, brought us down to the, uh, the bottom the field, uh, and I'll now turn it over to Raymond Gilpin and try to tie this all together. Uh, thank you very much, um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, I have a very um, difficult task, uh, following two very able speakers and trying to um, condense uh, the wealth of what they have shared in five minutes. <laughs> I'm also. Um, I'm also very pleased that um, we are focusing not just on uh, macro issues or generalities, but that we have a sense of how you connect the dots, not just in the policy environment, because that's where a lot of the discussion starts and ends. How do policies connect? But connecting the policy conundrum with reality on the ground is a much larger challenge. Um, let me flog um, Severin's book a bit. If you haven't got a copy, get one. I, are there discounts outside? Yes. Um, what I like about it is the fact that she spends quite a bit of time talking about how 
practical ways reality on the ground could be so much different if we just had the approach right from the beginning. Um, we talked a bit with the um, previous speaker, uh, Christine, talked about the scale of the tragedy, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of the indelible impact it has on the lives and livelihoods of families. That's not just um, women, of families. And I think she really brought us down to why are we engaged? Why are we involved? Why are we thinking about this? Um, on page 76 of the book, which I told you to buy, <laughs> um, se seven, oh no, you, 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 you're not leaving without <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, on page 76 of the book, um, Severine um, recalls a discussion with, some, with, with a French uh, official who likened the Congolese approach to violence to Europe in the Middle Ages. And reading the book, that's one of the sentences that stood out. Not just because I find it abhorrent, but because it's indicative of the milieu. The approach is, we, we, see, we, we um, believe that we are operating in a middle age type setting, and therefore, a lot of the in international approaches have been very medieval in their approach. They have a Hobbesian view of the world where life is short and brutish, and therefore, we really do not have to do much at the local level. However, anyone who knows anything about the conflict dynamics in the Democratic Republic of the Congo knows that we're dealing in a space, in a theater, where although we do have state-to-state -state and interstate complexities, a lot of the dynamics are at the local level. And so the ability to comprehend that and discard the notion that life is short and brutish, therefore, let's focus on the policy and it will trickle down eventually, is misguided. And the policy pronouncements that um, Sabirine rightly, rightly points out are spot on. However, there's some things I don't, I don't agree with in Sabirine's book. Um, I wouldn't list them. But the one thing that I think she did that um, I have a hobby horse about is the tendency when we're dealing with either humanitarian or development issues to default to jargon. Jargon is good because it's catchy, top down, bottom up. But again, that really doesn't tell you what you're talking about. Because top down in Liberia is different from top down in the DRC that Christine is talking about. And when you read the book and what, and what um, you leave with is a context that you need the top-down formula. Many times we, and one of the things that um, um, Severin's book and uh, Christine mentions is that we think that we've, we're in the theater, we've heard that millions have died, millions have been displaced, and therefore we need to do something. However, you know, the people really don't know what to do. So let's get there and we need to think outside the box. I think that is one of the worst phrases that business schools have bequeathed to the world. I agree. <laughs> when you enter a theater, the first thing you do is look inside the box because the answers are probably there. Uh, both Severine and Christine have given examples how at the community level, you really don't need rocket, um, rocket science or brain surgery to figure it out. And uh, we really um, need to pay um, some more attention to this. Um, one thing I think that um, Severine did not mention, I think is probably because <coughs> of the um, time, the, the duration she's talking about, or she's dealing with, or she's analyzing, is the importance of an international champion in these sort of interventions. If you look across the world at Bosnia, you had NATO front and center. Sierra Leone, you had the British front and center. 
And so there was some consensus on who is leading, what we'll be doing, how we will be engaging. Because even, think about it, even if we did have the will and the commitment, and there are so many different players doing different things, you will not be able to get the objective, to achieve the, or accomplish the objective of engaging the communities, engaging the households, and moving whole societies from instability and violence to stability and peace. And so that's one thing that I would have loved to see uh, a bit more, and we could talk about how that is evolving as we speak. Let me just very quickly um, to, um, mention three things I think we, um, need to, um, we, need, we need to consider moving on. I think the first is um, linked to my last point. We need uh, a champion, whether it's a, co a, a, it's a coalition, coalition of the willing or a group of countries, but we need a champion that has the credibility the resources and long-term commitment, not just to formulate the policy framework, but to link it directly to community needs over time. And this is very important, not just because the transition from humanitarian to um, development takes time, but also because you're dealing with healing societies. And that does take a lot of time. And so there needs to be a lot of flexibility as the societies adjust to new realities to be able to have approaches that um, speak more um, to their needs. Secondly, I would say, and um, Christine's book is excellent at this, let's avoid reductionism. Let's don't try to reduce the problem to bite-sized or um, bite-sized um, um, slogans we can feed to advocacy, advocacy groups or legislators. Um, let us take time to understand the various um, the dynamics in the various areas and apply um, accordingly. And thirdly, I think this is an excellent um, example and a great candidate for the use of smart power. Smart power involves diplomacy that would isolate the spoilers development that would empower the enablers, and defense that protects communities. I don't think that there is a, that the um, trouble with the international efforts, um, Chris, uh, Severin talked at, talked to, um, has uh, analyzed 2003 through um, five or six, but the um, trouble is that repeatedly we don't have this um, coordination, we don't have this um, focus and, uh, and approach, and we don't accord complex problems like the DRC the intellectual rigor that they deserve. And we are a little surprised that the, uh, we, we miss the mark in terms of um, outcomes and um, impact. Um, I'll stop here and uh, be more than happy to um, respond to questions or participate in the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Raymond. I think you have uh, pointed out some of the dilemmas and the problems when we are trying to uh, dissect some of, some of these issues. I'd like to give Sibling uh, maybe just a few minutes to, to uh, give some quick reactions to what Raymond has said. And you can stay maybe from here, from the table. And then I want to move, open it up to, um, to the audience. Sibling. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Is the mic working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I mean, for, first thing, uh, on Christine's presentation, to me, what Women for Women International is doing is exactly the kind of thing that we need in the Congo, uh, the, the kind of organizations that really know the specific locally, the specific areas, uh, the specific villages, and that, that has um, solutions and programs that are really tailored to the community and, and that put local actors, that put the villagers in the driver's seat so that they decide what they want and how they want it. Um, and, and I think that everything that Christine was talking about on how they approach uh, peace building and, and, and human rights in the Congo is really illustrative of, of the kind of grassroots movement that are going on in the Congo and that can be supported effectively by international actors. Um, on, on women's uh, presentation, 
Uh, yes, I, I mean, the, the thing about linking violence in the Congo to violence uh, in the Middle Ages, it's something that I saw in 2003 to 2006. I'm now back to the Congo for a year to work on another research project, and I continue to see the, this approach, um, this idea that, well, you know, it, it's really a Hobbesian environment. We need to reconstruct the state. Now, now the, the, the big mantra is we need to do state building, we need to do restoration of state authority, and as, as Remain was saying, it's, it's one of these slogans. It's like top down, bottom up. Now it's state building. And state building now in the Congo means we're going to build road and we're going to build big buildings, uh, prison, uh, jails, um, jails and administrative uh, buildings and uh, justice buildings. And we're going to build them. And then the, the, main, the main idea for the state building strategy is to make sure that we reconstruct a state, we extend state authority in the provinces, in the rural areas where there is no state authority. Because we think that state of, reconstructing state authority by itself is good. The problem with this kind of approach, it's really a Hobbesian approach. You know, you have anarchy, you need to reconstruct state authority. The problem is that when you talk to people in the Congo, they will tell you, well, the worst thing that can happen to me in a day is to meet with a soldier or to meet with a police officer. So we're coming with our thing, oh, we, ha we need to extend state authority. We need to make sure that the national army, the soldiers, the policemen, the authority can now be in the villages. But the problem is that th there is no questioning on what kind of soldiers we're deploying in the villages, what kind of policemen, what kind of state authority. So basically we're increasing human rights violations by deploying soldiers and policemen who are preying on the population. So... Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that in five years when I finish this research project. Okay. <laughs> okay, I see we have now a long line of um, people with comments and questions, so I would like to ask all of you to keep it brief. Uh, Agnes, I believe, you were first, but I also remember you can sometimes go on, so could you please keep it brief? Yeah. And one question, because we have a long line of people. Okay. Uh, I need a translator. Ah, ok, euh, nous cherchons une solution pour le Congo et euh, nous devons pointer, je répète encore, les vrais responsables. C'est quand nous aurons pointé les vrais responsables de ce qui se passe au Congo qui aura la paix au Congo. Okay. We're trying to find a solution for the Congo and we need to pinpoint all the uh, people who are responsible of uh, that situation. <laughs> Qui sont les, les vrais perpétuateurs On a parlé des militaires congolais. Mais ces militaires congolais se trouvent à travers le Congo, mais dans les autres provinces, on ne viole pas, sauf à l'Est. Who are... Yeah, it's on. It's on? Okay. Who are, respons who are the true perpetrators of those violences? Uh, they are known, and you can see that on, on other side of the Congo, not in the Eastern, there is no sexual violence or uh, gender-based uh, form of those Congolaise. from the, D, the FRDC. Les militaires qui sont là, ce sont les militaires rwandais qui ont été intégrés à plusieurs reprises dans l'armée congolaise. In the Eastern side of the Congo, those are Rwandese military who have been integrated in the uh, DRC army. En ce qui concerne les FDR, yes, la même que, chose. Est-ce que vous pouvez poser la question Non, c'est un commentaire que j'ajoute parce qu'on a besoin de solutions pour le problème du Congo. Il y a beaucoup Congo. de monde et si vous pouvez... Oui, je sais à chaque fois question. on me coupe la parole mais c'est la vérité. Bon, uh, j'arrête et j'ai dit mm -hmm. il n'y a pas de conflit local. Parce yep. que tous ces gens qui sont des miliciens aujourd'hui, c'était des fermiers qui travaillaient leur terre. Qui leur a donné des armes Qui les a entraînés Qui a fait de, des miliciens et des groupes armés Voilà la question. Uh, Merci beaucoup. I will end by asking the question. Those people who are today in the army group were, were former in the time. Uh, who gave them uh, the, the weapon or all those uh, material that they need to perpetrate the violence in the East. Okay, thank you. Sissi? We, we group a number of questions since there's a lot of uh, people. So. 
Thank you. Cecile Aptel, um, GR, Senior Fellow here at USAP. First, um, I would like to thank each one of you, um, certainly Severine, for your great book and analysis and, and then documentaries. Thank you. Um, you alluded to the importance of, of natural resources and in particular mineral resources. And when you mentioned the uh, local conflict, you indicated that part of it is for access and control of our land, but not only land as farming land, but land as a place where you have mines and, and those vast richness and quite exclusive richness that the DRC has, in particular in terms of Colton, which is a, 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 an absolutely um, uh, a resource that the DRC has almost exclusively in the world. Um, do you actually see this as one of the major factors fueling the conflict? And if so, what could be the policy implication? Should we envisage something along the line of a Kimberley process to replicate what has been done for Diamond on other resources such as Coltan? And, and is that an option? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sana. Good morning. Um, Sana Mandrelini, uh, International Civil Society Action Network. As you were speaking, Severin, I, I, uh, I felt as if I was back in 1996 in London because uh, we, were, we were talking about um, – I was working at International Alert, and we were doing things like coming up with conflict and peace analysis frameworks as the basis of first understanding what's happening and looking at, you know, who are the actors, regional, local, and so forth. And uh, – to be the to get the analysis to then be able to determine what kind of programming needed to be done with who and where were the positive and where were the negative forces and so forth, and it was all meant to be in multi stakeholders what i 've seen over the last ten fifteen years is that those frameworks have filtered somewhat into the work of development actors, but when it comes to being used they 're really doing it in a cursory way sometimes they arrive in country and they 're sitting in their hotel rooms and just cutting and pasting other times they do the framework, but then they say oh no we can 't do this because our five year plan says that we should be doing something else and and so my question is, what are we seeing in terms of um, the donors or the international community coming in um, in terms of how they engage the different stakeholders really to get that initial understanding because I agree I, th I think we do need to work the regional the, the you know the think about the Kimberley approach and what is Rwanda doing, but, it, but at the same time, clearly what you were saying also makes sense. And who, who out there is doing it, and how do we make sure that it actually gets done? Thanks. Okay. Um, Agnes, yes. Uh, th there are Rwandan perpetrators. Uh, there is a Rwandan involvement in the Congo. Um, the the violence is uh, linked in part uh, to the presence of the Rwandan state, the Rwandan actors. Uh, but it's, it's not the only problem. Uh, for example, most, I mean, the, this analysis is saying everything is because of Rwanda, and if Rwanda would be out of the Congo, then we would be at peace. I, I don't think it holds because, for example, in 1993, Rwanda was not in the Congo. The Rwandan genocide had not ha happened yet. And yet you had extensive local conflicts in Masisi. You had massacres. You have massive human, ri human rights violations. So I'm afraid that by continuing to say, oh, there is, there is no local conflict, there is no conflict among Congolese people, it's all the fault of Rwanda. We're just, um, we're just pushing uh, international peace builder to continue to work at the regional level and to ignore uh, what, what grassroots people, what, what people on the ground uh, really want, which is to live at peace with their neighbors, but also to be able to, to for example, to, have, to know who owns the land, to know who, uh, who is uh, entitled to traditional power, to legitimate power. Basically, they, they want to have, their, uh, to have uh, conflicts resolved on, on a local level uh, and not only on a regional level. Um, Cecile, um, the importance of national resources as, yes, it, it is one, one of the factors leading the, con uh, fueling the conflict. It is extremely important at the, nat at the local level, just, at, uh, just, just as it is at the national <coughs> level. Uh, in terms on how, what is best to, um, what, what, what's best to do, 
I think we need to, to look at each specific mineral and, and how, they are, um, how they are dug out and, and what are the social implications of the minerals in the different communities. Um, and I haven't looked very much at, at the response to, to mineral exploitation per se, but I would be afraid of having one blanket solution uh, designed in international capital and, and then that, that just trickles down on the ground and that may di- maybe disrupt uh, the livelihood of people. Um, there, there have been really interesting analyses done by various uh, Congolese and international groups on what mining resources means for people in the villages. And, and, and every time we see uh, policies that are, that are uh, thought about and that are designed uh, in, in Western capital, uh, usually they actually hurt people on the ground more than they help them. So, so I, would, I would be more for an approach that actually goes to the various villages, the various ma- mining areas and that really makes sure that the solution is locally grounded. Um, and uh, said that, yes, well, international alert is actually one of the uh, – w- in, in the book, I talk about exceptions to the dominant approach, and actually, actually uh, I have you know, a lot on international alert and search for common ground and life and peace institute. Um, what we see in terms of dollar and, and how they engage the different stakeholder, what I've seen mostly is that they are like, oh yes, we, we do have local partners, but local usually means national. Mm-hmm. So local engaging local partners still mostly means talking to the government in Kinshasa, or at best talking with the governor on, of North Kivu. It doesn't mean going to Masisi, to Ruchuru, uh, to Walikale, and sitting down with the villagers and asking them what they want and how they want to do things. So I think we we need to, in in terms of the framework and in terms of what kind of advocacy we want to do, I think we need to insist, yeah, it's great now you're taking national authorities into account, fantastic, but, you know, let's let's go a a step further. Christine, do you have a comment maybe on the, the local international interaction? I think she said everything, that the way we had to, the views, the eyes of the experts in the gra- ground as the grassroots people is really matters because they may give us some insights we cannot um, apprehend as an international community and that can help us that the, our investment in terms of program is more effective <laughs> and can be there can be an ownership on what we are implementing because overall is for the, those communities. So we have to leave and empower those communities to be able to stand on themselves and to develop a, a, a sustainable peace in their environment. Okay. Uh, Raymond, ju- yes. Just a very quick one mm-hmm. on the um, resource question. I completely agree with you, Severine, that um, we need to have things that work at a local level, but we also need to have... Um, instruments that um, speak to, like, the companies that do business. And um, the, um, I'm not sure if you know, but the um, Dob franks bill here in the United States has specific language on the DRC requiring companies to specify who they bought it from, where it came from, etc. And this is recognized internationally as... Um, taking a leadership role in trying to bring transparency to a very opaque process. It's a first step, but I think it's an important step. And the next issue will be how that then connects to reality on the ground. Okay. Let's go to the next and last round, please. Thank you. Uh, Nita Evel with Congo Global Action. Uh, uh, just like uh, Sanam just say, listening to the presentation of Ms. Osite Otiser, I went back 10 years ago when the framework about the Congo conflict was about ethnic conflict. I think that was the big mistake when everybody was uh, pushing to see the Congolese conflict as an ethnic conflict. And that's why mistakes have happened a lot because they forgot to mention the regional, the, 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 the money and everything that goes around. Because uh, uh, I, I'm going to disagree, the problem in Congo is not local itself. Because saying that we have to take... Uh, 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 put a special uh, interest on local um, conflict between neighbors or between people living in the same village. It's saying that in the Cong- Congolese are c- some kind of subspecies of people where mm-hmm. law and order cannot be um, implemented. We have to listen to the villager to have like a, 
a, a, a specific way of dealing with conflict between neighbors. Uh, conflict between neighbors happen all over the place. I mean, in the Congo, all they have to do is to implement the laws. And we have a constitution that talks about land, how land is reformed, how, who belongs to what land. But saying that we have to um, forget about that and have a specific where the NGOs will be the people uh, uh, trying to figure out how to reform the land. And, and, and I mean, <laughs> it's saying that in a Congo we cannot have justice, we cannot talk about cri- that's criminality. When a neighbor kills another neighbor, that's criminal uh, 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 matters. In 1993, like you said, the reason why people start fighting is because the, the states just failed. The Mobutu regime was failing, and there were no order, no authority. That's why people start uh, uh, avenging itse- themselves. But in the setting like now we are, we, we passed that 10 years, 15 years ago, where we have laws, we have a government, we have all those pe- things. We need to stop talking about local justice and local and, and traditional uh, uh, peace me- building, and we have to implement the laws. I mean, Congolese are, are human beings just like everybody. They know about uh, rights, they know about the justice system. Okay. They just have to implement that. So uh, I really have an issue with that. I think we got your point. Uh. Hello. My name is Valérie Rousseau, and I am a senior fellow here uh, at the USIP. Thank you very much for your presentation, each of you. <laughs> Severine, I really, really appreciated your book. Thank you very much. Um, two brief questions. The first one is that uh, you mentioned that things have evolved since 2006. I would like you just to stress the main points. Like The second thing is um, you stress two priorities areas, land reform commission, truth commissions, right? Uh, what would be concretely the role of international peace, build, peace builders in these processes? And I have, some, I have a concern in mind. Uh, I know quite well the Belgian case, since I am a Belgian. Uh, and uh, in Belgium, uh, there is a fear to be seen as a post-colonial power, of course. And it's a, a real um, feeling of guilt, which is untangible, but which is extremely uh, important in terms of foreign policy, I think. And uh, knowing that the land reform and the truth commission are, by definition, local, what could be their implication in this local area because they would, they will not feel comfortable. It's much more easier to give money for the election, right, than for... Okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you. Uh, may I ask, we have four more people. May I ask you to be very brief so that we can, all four of you can get your, your comments or questions in, please. My name is uh, Maman Jeanne Kassongo. I would uh, speak in French. Uh, je voudrais seulement vous demander de m'excuser. Je n'ai pas de questions à poser. Je suis congolaise. Je n'ai pas de questions à poser. D'accord. Vous pouvez faire un commentaire, mais si ça peut être très bref. S'il vous plaît, madame. Uh, nous sommes ici à l'Institut... Uh, tu peux utiliser le micro, je peux, ma voix est très forte. À l'Institut pour la paix. Si réellement on veut la paix au Congo... Il faut aller parler avec les Congolais pour leur, vous demand, leur, euh, qu'ils vous disent ce qu'ils veulent pour leur pays. Je vais vous donner un adage africain. Il y a beaucoup d'experts congolais, puisqu'ils ont vécu cinq ans au Congo. Ils ont lu des livres sur le Congo. Mais il y a beaucoup de Congolais qui ont fait 30 ans ici en Amérique qui ne sont pas des experts d'Amérique. Mais il y a un adage africain qui dit ceci. Une pierre, un morceau de, de bois, il peut faire 100 ans ou 1000 ans dans l'eau ou dans la rivière. Il ne deviendra jamais un crocodile. Adage a proverb. Uh, proverb. Mm-hmm. Yes. A proverb. Uh, there are so many experts on the Congolese matter because they spent five years in Congo and read so many books. But there are so many uh, Congolese who spent 30 years here, they will never say they are experts in America. And mm-hmm. also in Africa, we say a piece of wood can spend 30 years in the, in the water, it will never become a crocodile. <laughs> Donc l'histoire de l'eau, allez poser la question au crocodile. What is when it's about uh, water or everything in the sea, go ask the question to the crocodile. Alors, la paix au Congo, 
des panels comme ça, c'est nous Congolais qui devons être là et Congolais, vous expliquer à vous la population ce que les Congolais veulent et vous nous poser des questions. Moi, je n'ai pas de questions à poser aux experts Congolais. Moi, Congolaise, j'ai des solutions à donner à ceux qui peuvent aider le Congo. And speaking about the Congo, so you, to tell you how we can build that base and you asking us your question. Okay. Uh, uh, just une petite, uh, un petit ajout pour un peu rafraîchir la mémoire. Excusez-moi, madame, mais il y a des moments où qui, qui nous est donné. Ce n'est pas chaque fois qu'on nous donne ces possibilités. Ça fait trois jours, nous a, sommes venus à une conférence qui parlait de la femme avec la guerre. Pendant tous les trois jours, on n'a parlé que du Congo. Cela veut dire que le problème du Congo est très important pour le moment. She, she emphasizes that over this three-day conference, we have talked a lot about the Congo, so it means it's a really important issue. Uh, je voudrais dire, on parle beaucoup des élections démocratiques qu'il y a eu au Congo. Moi, je suis ici, j'ai vécu des élections démocratiques ici. Les candidats, on le met là-bas, on met son nom. Sa date de naissance, c'est où il est né. Quelles sont ses études Docteur en ceci, en cela. S'il vous plaît, excusez-moi. On met d'où il sort, qui étaient ses parents. On va fouiller même à 4e, 5e génération. Au Congo, il y a eu des élections, s'il vous plaît, des élections soi-disant euh, euh, démocratiques. Il y a eu deux candidats. Au premier tour, il y a un qui avait euh, 60% de voix qui est congolais né au Congo, qui a ça, qui a tel PhD, qui est ceci, qui est cela. Il y a un autre. On n'a pas su. Il n'y avait oh, même deux générations du Congo. On n'avait pas tout cela. C'est là okay. qui ne nous avait pas été donné. Alors maintenant, je ne refuse, je ne dis pas qu'il n'est pas congolais. J'ai dit ceci. Que ici, puisque pour que quelqu'un puisse l'idée être là au-dessus, c'est quelqu'un qui a la connaissance un peu partout. On n'est pas dit qu'il doit être expert dans quoi que ce soit, mais qui est quand même qui a une connaissance. Et là, c'était un, un jeune garçon qui est venu en tant que rebelle. Okay. On, could, on a compris yeah. votre. Could my we, colleague Raymond yeah. Gilpin will give a brief answer and also translate what you have just said. Mais pendant ce temps, yeah. il y a eu le rapport mapping de l'ONU sur les solutions could, pour le Congo. Madame, please, 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 please. Um, I just want to. Um, I'm not going to translate because that will be a catastrophe. <laughs> but, but, no, no, but there's no, there's no need, need to, need, there's no need to translate. I think the gist of the, the gist of the issue was that this is the Congolese issue. We should be listening to the Congolese. Um, I'd just like to point out that the United States Institute of Peace is the only institute in Washington, D.C. that has an ongoing Congolese diaspora series. Over the last two years, we have had meetings with just the Congolese telling us what the problems are, what the solutions are. We have brought Deputy Assistant Secretaries of State here. We have brought people from the Treasury, from the Department of Defense here to listen to just the Congolese. And uh, we, have, we, have, we have also brought people from the World Bank, the UN, the IFC here to listen to the Congolese. We are currently editing a document written by Congolese on the... So I think it is very, very, very disingenuous for the lady to suggest that we disregard the Congolese voice. The interpreter is one of the um, authors on the book, on, on, on the paper that we're writing, just by the Congolese. And so I think that anybody who thinks that the Institute of Peace disregards or does not engage the Congolese diaspora or, the, or Congolese people or the crocodiles in the river should be, um, I think that is, and you know, I feel, I, I take this very, very, very personally because we have gone over and beyond to make sure that the Congolese diaspora's voices are heard. No need to translate, George. No need to translate. No, 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 need, no need to confirm. I think people can take me at my word. This, this um, panel again, illustrates that of all the countries in the world, we are spending an entire panel on Congo. And I think it helps for us to understand the value of bringing different perspectives in 
And then what is wrong? We say this exactly is what is wrong. This is the right way to do it, rather than suggest that if you're not from the region, you don't have an opinion or you don't have a voice. I think that is very un, undemocratic, un-Congolese, and un-American. Um, I think it's, a, it's a pro- probably a very sour note on which to um, bring a really, really good panel to the close because we have actually run out of time. Uh, we have run out of time, but I still want to give both Christine and Céline uh, a few uh, seconds to, to have some wrap-up comments. I also want to remind you that the whole morning we continue talking about the Congo, so please hold your fire, if I, to, <laughs> if I may, uh, for the next session. Um, Christine. I can feel the way she's feeling, but that's not the way we can solve problems. The way we can solve problems, we are bringing really the reality of Congolese on the table. Um, It is clear that they may not be Congolese by nationality, but there are many, many people who have the heart of Congolese, who cares about what is happening for Congolese, and who are willing to see the changes reason why three days thinking about how we can solve problem it can is very very something for me to know that people are just here not for anything but to see how we can solve problem in congo it for me a plowed for for everybody and we are in the process and we need everybody on board to make uh, sustainable changes in the country and across the region Thank you. On on the first question, uh, yeah, the the ethnic framework, thinking that the Congo is an ethnic problem, it's still one of the misconceptions that we hear uh, today. I just want to clarify, when I said that conflicts are local, it doesn't mean that conflicts are ethnic. Uh, It's different. You can have local conflicts about political power, about economic resources, about social status. It's not an ethnic problem. It's just local versus national, regional. And I'm, 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 I'm a bit puzzled as to how we could think that having local conflict resolution in the Congo means treating the Congolese as a subspecies. Um, we have local conflict resolution in every country in the world. It has different uh, different names, um, different implementers. Sometimes it's NGOs, sometimes it's the justice system. We have it in France, we have it in the United States, we have it in, in, in African countries, in Asian countries. Uh, so I don't see why we couldn't have it in the Congo, and I think that Congolese are entitled to it, just as our Americans and French. And, and other citizens of the world. Um, on Valerie's question, uh, how things have evolved. And basically, well, I, I see two steps in the right direction. Uh, the first one is that now we have an act, we start to have an acknowledgement that local conflicts matter. So, for example, when, when uh, I'm based in North Kivu this year in Goma, and, and people t- very regularly talk to me about land conflict and the importance of land conflict, which is something that they never do, they would never do five years ago. So, so I think that's a step in the right direction. The problem is that then w- when they talk to me about land conflict, it's about the problem of refugees returning to the Congo. So it's still this local conflict linked to a big regional issue, the return of Rwanda, of refugees uh, based in Rwanda coming back to the Congo. So, and, and they don't talk about land conflict that, are, that, that matter for, for villagers who are not linked to, to refugees' return. So it's, it's just a small step. And, and same thing in terms of programs to support local conflict resolution. Uh, we have a small step in the right direction. For example, UN Habitat now is, uh, is doing programs to resolve land conflict in the two Kivus. Um, again, it's a very, very small step because when you look at how many people they have and, and the resources they have, they have uh, six people working on the two Kivus and one car. Uh, it's, I mean, it's great to have a program. We just need to give them so much more resources. And same thing for all kind of local conflict resolution programs. And finally, on concretely how international actors can support our local conflict resolution and make sure that we're not imperialist or, or neocolonial, etc. cetera. To, to me, when we really, really put Congolese grassroots actors in the driver's seat, and we, we, have, uh, we have a role just as enabler, just, okay, you need money, then we give you money. You need logistic resources, you need a car, you need some training on how to do something or something else. When we actually respond to what they ask us to do and we really make sure that they 
they, they, they are the spokesperson, that they are the program manager, that they are the program director, that they decide what they want to do and how they want to do it, then to me it's not a neo-colonial enterprise because we're, we're merely facilitating the work that Congolese grassroots actors themselves want to do. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you will join me in thanking the panel. And and Raymond Gilpin, and I would say stay tuned because Raymond is indeed the one who regularly organizes uh, events here at USIP on the Congo. Um, I would suggest that we take a very short break, a break of five minutes and then reconvene here at 11 o'clock for the next panel. Okay.